Yeah? Okay. All right. All right. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get going with Keynote 3, Rethinking the Rules for Better Outcomes. My name is Dr. Jenny Moore, and I'm the Director of Sustainability at the British Columbia Institute of Technology, and I'm the uh, program convener, and we'll be moderating today's session. Before we proceed, I'd like to make the following safety announcements. In case of an emergency, please inform staff, and they'll be able to provide assistance. There's a first aid station at the registration desk, and washrooms are located at various venues around the convention center. I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the unceded land of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I'd like to um, start things off right away with um, our keynote from Kate Raworth. And Kate won't be able to stay for the whole panel, so we'll have her do her presentation, then we'll take some questions from the audience, and then we'll move on to uh, Julian Ageman's keynote, and he will stay, and then we'll have a panel discussion with him. So this morning's keynote, Rethinking the Rules for Better Outcomes, um, it's really a pleasure to have uh, Kate Raworth with us. Her presentation is called Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist, and I'll just give you a little bit of Kate's background before we get going. Kate is, uh, well, I should say Dr. Raworth, excuse me for being so informal, is an economist dedicated to making economics fit for the 21st century. Her book, Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist, is an international bestseller that has been translated into 15 languages. And it was long listed for the 2017 Financial Times and McKinsey Bo Business Book of the Year Award. She teaches at Oxford University's Environmental Change Institute and is an advisor to the Global Challenges Program of the Stockholm School of Economics and to the Center of the Understanding for Sustainable Prosperity at the University of Surrey. Over the past two decades, Kate has worked as a senior researcher at Oxfam, as an economist and co-author of the UN's Human Development Report, and as a fellow of the Overseas Development Institute based in the villages of Zanzibar. She holds a BA and Master's in Science from Oxford University and an honorary doctorate from Business School Lausanne. Please help me welcome Kate Roberts. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Can you see me clearly, hear me clearly? Somebody make a noise to let me know that's all good. Yeah. You can, yay, okay. Well, I'm really delighted to be joining you. I'm so sorry I'm not there in person. I'm at another city summit. I'm at the C40 summit of mayors in Copenhagen. Uh, we just had Al Gore giving a really uh, preaching to the mayors, telling them, God damn it, you've got to step up for your generation. So. There's some city power going on here too, but I really wish I was with you there because my, my vision of cities I feel is very aligned with that of EcoCity. So thank you for letting me join you this way anyway. What I want to do is talk about the economics, the economic mindset that ruled the 20th century that we need to escape and reinvent if we're going to reinvent our cities. So imagine yourself in any city. What is it that shapes the way we think cities succeed what we think a good city is, what city progress is, I think it is profoundly shaped by the underlying economic mindset that many of us are taught, but all of us absorb. It's what happens in economics departments like this one the world over. And tragically, I think is still happening in economics departments the world over today. Outdated mindset is still being taught. I want to present what I think is the essence of that mindset and then reinvent it. And I'm really looking forward to staying for Julian's presentation afterwards because I know that he has been many years been putting very similar ideas into practice with huge impact. So 20th century economics. What's the first image that people ever learn? It is, of course, supply and demand. As if to say, welcome to economics, the economy is the market. When we know that that's an extraordinarily narrow view, but it puts price at the center of our vision on day one. It puts the market as the primary medium of interaction and anything that's not priced gets pushed off to the margins and is called an externality. What about the selfie, the portrait of humanity? It is, of course, rational economic man. He never actually gets drawn, so I decided to give him a portrait. He'd have to look a bit like this. He'd be a man, no dependence, standing alone with money in his hand, ego in his heart, a calculator in his head, and nature at his feet. He hates work, he loves luxury, and he knows the price of everything. And he is so profoundly destructive to us because on being taught 
that he is like us. Economic students actually aspire to become more like him. Over time, they value self-interest and competition more than, say, collaboration and altruism. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. What about the economic laws of motion that obsess 20th century economists, as if by making economics follow laws, it could aspire to be a science as reputable as physics? Isaac Newton found the physical laws of motion, and I think economists were set off in search of their own. Three such laws, which all turn out to be false, hugely influenced all of our lives through 20th century policymaking. And the first is on inequality. It's the Kuznets curve, drawn in the 1950s by a brilliant economist, Simon Kuznets, who found in the data at the time that it seemed to tell us that as economies get richer over time, first inequality rises, but then it will fall. It turns out this is not a law of economics at all. It was an anomaly of the pre-war to post-war era. But once the curve is drawn, it whispers its own, uh, it whispers its own mantra, which is if you care about inequality, don't intervene and try and redistribute because you might slow down growth. And growth, you see, will clean up and, and even up after itself. This is false, but it's justified trickle-down and austerity economics in so many countries for decades. It was followed in the 1990s by a, an apparent environmental Kuznets law on pollution, that as economies get richer, first, pollution may increase, but don't worry, it will then clean up after itself. But this is only true in some places for local air and water pollutants. It is not true when we take account of global pollutants like carbon dioxide, like an ecological footprint of a country. It's water footprint, nutrient footprint, land footprint. So don't wait for growth to clean up after itself. We have to intervene. But these two apparent laws of motion, that growth would even things up and clean things up, became an extraordinary justification for the mother of all economic laws, the idea that economic growth itself would and could and should be endless, no matter how rich a country already is. And our politicians, whether at the city level or at the national level, are so still caught in the notion that the success of the city will always be described as more growth. These laws have underpinned cities that have been built with shopping malls that bring us together in the market, with the individualism of every person to their car, with the pollution that so many cities endure today, and with the extraordinary levels of inequality, as I've shown here in, in uh, LA, but all over the world. Growth does not transform these things. 20th century economics does not serve our cities. We need to transform them ourselves. So where would we begin? I offer you a donut to begin that transformation. It's a compass we could use for 21st century prosperity. And the idea here is that in the hole, in the middle of the donut, is a place where people are falling short on the essentials of life. It's where they don't have the resources each person needs for food, water, healthcare, housing, energy, political voice, equality. These 12 dimensions I crowdsourced from the world's governments from the Sustainable Development Goals. So every government has agreed that every person has a claim to fulfilling these needs. Leave nobody in the donut's hole. But at the same time, do not overshoot the ecological ceiling. Because there we put so much pressure on our planet that we push her out of balance. We cause climate breakdown, catastrophic collapse of ecosystems, excessive nitrogen and phosphorus loading that kills off lakes and rivers. These around the edge are the nine planetary boundaries of Earth system science, the life-supporting systems of our delicately balanced planet Earth. So put the two together, and the aim is to meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. If that's the aim, where are we? Well, no, sorry, let me say this. If that's the aim, it's not the full aim, because if we imagine the donut as a foundation of well-being, then what we really want are the lived experience of human well-being, understanding and freedom and purpose and participation, our fundamental human needs. And I believe that the donut offers one version of a framework that allows us to express this, as do the EcoCity standards offer us a framework for producing the fundamentals that then allow human well-being. So if that's where we want to go to, this is where we are now. All the red shows you the extent to which people are falling short on the middle, on the essentials of life, without the food, water, healthcare, housing, 
but we are already overshooting planetary boundaries. In recent headlines, climate change is hitting harder and sooner than forecast. Since 1970, 60% of other living animals have been lost. Microplastics in human bodies the world over. Toxic air pollution, land degradation, water shortages, phosphorus pollution, ocean acidification, and the richest 1% of people own half of the world's wealth. If you need some good news, NASA says the hole in Earth's ozone layer is finally closing up because humans did something about it. And that's the point. We can do something about all of this. And the reason I'm in Copenhagen, and I think the reason why many of you are in Vancouver, is because we believe that cities are the place where we are most likely to do something about all of this. Some researchers at Leeds University scaled the nut down to the national level. Here are three nations, all beginning with C, with very different circumstances. The goal here is to fill the central circle in blue, but without overshooting that green biophysical boundary. Cameroon is barely overshooting any pressure on the planet, but falling very far short on meeting people's needs. Canada, almost meeting everybody's needs, but like many other high-income countries, appallingly falling short. We're one of the richest countries in the world, like my own country, the UK, like Denmark, where I am now, still not meeting everybody's needs, but massively overshooting on the planetary balance. Not just resources consumed in the country, but all the embedded consumption of water, of all the embedded carbon emissions and land use and phosphorus in our consumption patterns. So Costa Rica in the middle, gives us huge hope that some countries are far closer than others to finding something like a 21st century balance. So this is the first diagram that I teach when I start teaching economics, because I want students to see that the economy is embedded in society. It is a social construct. It is something we have created. And the society is embedded in the living world, drawing in materials and matter putting out waste and pollution, bathed in this solar river of energy. But look within the economy itself. It's not just the market. Of course, the market's there. But there's also the state. But the 20th century got obsessed with this boxing match between the market and the state and forgot a marginalized, pushed aside two other fundamental sources of our provisioning. The household where we all begin every day with the unpaid care of cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping and raising the children. And the commons where people come together, not through the market, not through the state, but as a community, co-producing goods and services that they value. And to me, essence of 21st century economics starts with recognizing all of these four forms of provisioning and that finance should be in service not to itself, but in service to making these four forms of provisioning work well. And of course, the state has a key role in rebalancing because the 20th century was massively dominated by the market. And we need our 21st century cities to be rebalanced between these four kinds of relationship. And that leads me on to thinking about our economic identities, because when we begin economics with supply and demand, then who we show up as is rational economic man, the market actor. He's either consuming or producing shopping or working, or shopping or working, or shopping or working. Bring in banking, and we're either a creditor or debt. And these are the kinds of spaces where we get to play out that role. But step back. Oh, and these they bring back these fundamental human needs. 20th century marketing, of course, did a very good job of convincing us, or at least trying to convince us, that we would meet these needs for identity and belonging and creativity and participation if we go shopping, that that's how we'll belong. Turns out to be a false chase. So let's step back and reclaim our many economic identities because in relation to the state, we may be resident, public servant, voter or protester. Household, we are parent, guardian, relative and child. And in the commons, we are co-creator, sharer, repairer and steward. And I think the 21st century depends much in our cities as elsewhere on us reclaiming the values and skills and the fun of these diverse economic identities. I think of it as inter economic intersectionality, that our lives operate at the intersections of many of these identities and we need to weave them back together again. And our cities must create spaces for us to inhabit them all. There are of course the shadows of each of these. People may be jobless or stateless or homeless or dispossessed. And again, our cities need to re-include them 
in city and cultural life. Because this, when we come back to these fundamental human needs, this, I believe, is where we will best achieve and meet those needs through our relationships of state, household, commons, as well as the market. So this, I think, is essential uh, for reinventing humanity, our communities and our culture, as well as our cities. So how can cities help bring us into the donut, meet the needs of all people while coming back within planetary boundaries? We've never even tried to do this before. Certainly not through 20th century ideas, because growth won't even things up again. It won't challenge the deep inequalities in this picture. And growth won't clean things up again. It won't bring us back inside planetary boundaries. We need totally new designs that are fit for our own times. And to me, two driving principles are to create economies that are distributive and regenerative by design. So I'll share a little bit about each of those. This is the essence of our degenerative linear 20th century industrial inheritance. We take Earth's materials, make them into stuff we want, use it for a while, and then throw it away. And this is what it looks like when we take again and again and again from Earth's sources. This is what it looks like when we throw our waste again and again and again into her sinks, into the rivers and lakes, throwing our plastic pollution and electronic waste into the neighborhoods of the world's poorest people. I sincerely believe that your children and mine will look back at these photos with astonishment that we could ever have thought that this was normal. We need to bend those linear arrows around and create a cyclical or circular economy where resources are never used up, they're used again and again, where we work with and within the cycles of the living world, where we re regenerate organic and natural material, where we restore, repair, reuse, refurbish, recycle technical materials. And cities, of course, are going to be the place where this happens. But I think there's a real danger, uh, and I don't want to evangelize the circular economy. There are two very different possibilities for the circular economy. One that I call siloed circularity, where every company wants to recycle and remake and refurbish its own products. So there we get materials flowing through closed loops, return to the brand, the standards are owned and protected, so the governance is in-house and the technology is proprietary. I won't tell you how I made this. I won't let you disassemble it. Bring it back to me and I'm retaining control. I believe the circular economy we need is the one that nature has, which is a series of nested loops of materials. Nature builds from amazing building blocks of oxygen and hydrogen and carbon, of lignin and chitin and keratin, breaks back down to the building box and builds anew. She doesn't send things in the same little loops. So we need nested loops that return materials not to the single brand, but to an ecosystem where standards, therefore, are open and shared, the governance is network-wide, and we have a knowledge commons. That is going to emerge from how we design not just our nations, but our cities. Here's an example from me of one organization that is helping to bring the city ecosystem together Circle Economy have been doing circular city scans, and I know many other organizations are doing this, looking at the flow of nutrients here in Glasgow between beer and spirits, meat and fish, the bakeries. This may tell us something about the Glaswegian diet and how the, the, the nutrients and foods can be looped around in flow. But this is a top-down approach to creating that network. Of course, we also need and are seeing the bottom bubble up. And I love going to repair cafes, libraries of things, maker spaces. Here are some popping up all over the world, indeed, in, as well in Canada. When I go to maker spaces, I like uh, to repair cafes. I often don't take anything to be repaired. I just stand and observe the human interaction and the experience and the sound of people interacting. Because when I think about fundamental human needs, these maker spaces fulfill so many of them. People feeling purpose in using their skills, purpose in helping others, the pleasure of interacting with strangers and hearing about their story, a sense of identity and belonging. So I feel real hope that the fundamental human needs we have can and will be realized if we design our regenerative economies well. So that's a regenerative story. What about the distributive story? This red in the middle of the picture and the overshoot, just extraordinary divisive economies we have at the moment. And we need to turn that round and end the incredible injustice of inequality for people, even in the richest of the countries. So I like the concept of public luxury. And here are four places, Curitiba's transport, Vienna's housing, Helsinki's education, 
public space in Paris and many more cities can celebrate what they could call public luxury, public goods that are available and affordable to all and that are actually a better choice than some sort of private alternative. This, I think, is a very 21st century concept. But the thing that I'm really excited about on a bigger, longer scope of technological change that I think open up key possibilities for cities is that any form of production, anything we want to make, needs a source of energy, a means of production, of communication, and a store of knowledge. And in the 20th century, these technologies were centralized by design. Energy from an oil rig or a coal mine, production in a mass Fordist factory, communications literally through a centralized switchboard, knowledge in patents and copyrights. And this century, our huge opportunity is that for the first time, the technologies are asking to be distributive by design. Energy through wind and turbines dotted across landscapes and in this village in India. Production, not in a Fordist factory, but maybe on a desk top with a 3D printer of printing buildings and plastics and metals. Communications, every person in that room you're in in Vancouver has a node of the network in their pocket or in their hand, as does this woman in a village in Tanzania. And knowledge, not just patents and copyrights, but now the rise of open source and Creative Commons licensing. We've barely begun to put the full potential of these four distributive technologies together. But if you wanted to go to a place where you begin to see the early possibilities of them, well, I would go to a fab lab, a makerspace, whose motto is we share the recipes of how to construct our world using local materials because atoms are heavy, so should stay local, but sharing ideas globally because bits and data can travel globally as I'm managing to talk to you across the world right now. Fab labs popping up everywhere that again engage that fundamental human needs of creativity and collaboration and identity and belonging. And if you're thinking, well, it's all very well for Spain, Ireland, Netherlands and Japan, they're popping up in places you may not yet have expected, in Togo, in Tanzania, in India, in Bhutan. To me, this is the great hope of leapfrogging the deprivations of the past. But again, like the circular economy, it could get captured. So we need to ensure that we don't go down the route of the big five digital players capturing the base. So I'm going to pull back. I believe if we're going to transform and get ourselves inside the donut from both sides at the same time, we need cities that are patterning and proving and demonstrating regenerative design and distributive design at the same time. And so we'll move away from these very, very familiar patterns. And as I'm sure you're seeing in many city examples, you know, I'm hearing at this conference that I'm at with the mayors, we start to replace the idea that where we hang out at the weekend is a shopping mall with where we hang out is on the right bank of the River Seine in Paris. This used to be a motorway. It's now a public park that instead of traveling alone in a car, we can travel together by bike. That instead of cities that are deeply polluted and the air is toxic, this is uh, the fourth cleanest city in India, Indore, where you may not have expected to find trees and life coming back. And instead of homelessness, housing for the homeless, which again is a deeply purposeful, regenerative public luxury that everybody should have a stake in. So what is it that leaves some cities with that old polluted vision and allows others to start moving in this direction? And this is the last real point that I want to convey. But in my meetings with mayors over the last two days, the idea I'm going to show you now is the one that they've most said, uh-huh, and, and taken a screenshot and taken it back to their teams. And it's this idea that the 20th century was dominated by cities that were serving a growth city, that growth is the goal, of course, whether it's growth of the population or the economy or of our roads or of our housing. And that more and more cities now are realizing that what they need to serve is thriving city. That doesn't necessarily mean that the city isn't getting bigger in one of those dimensions, but getting bigger is no longer its purpose or metric of success. And what is it that has some cities saying still, how much economic growth can we achieve in the way we run the city? while others are asking how many benefits for people, for planet, for culture, for community can we generate in the way we shape our city? What are the design traits? I think there are five. And I draw these from the brilliant corporate analyst, Marjorie Kelly. I think they can be uh, uh, applied just as much to our cities. So the first, of course, is purpose. 
What is the city's stated purpose? I'm hearing more and more mayors state not the word growth in their city, but thriving, regenerative, inclusive within planetary countries. And to me, that is the start of the shift we need to make. How is the city networked? Is the city hall, the city municipality, at the C40 summit of the world's most ambitious climate mayors? Is the C40 networking, sorry, is the city hall networking with organizations like EcoCity saying, how can your standards empower us? Who is it procuring its goods and services from? How does it relate to its citizens? What are the corporate lobbies? What are the civil society alliances that it's part of? Because they will determine whether it gets pulled back to the growth mentality or drawn forward to thriving. Governance, all of the questions, who's at the table of decision making? Do citizens have a say how and when? What are the metrics, the culture, the principles by which the city is governed? But now down to the really profound stuff. How is the city owned? Who owns the land on which the city is built? Who owns the data of the inhabitants of the city? Who has the right to choose those who are the decision makers in the city? Because how the city is owned will deeply connect to how this is financed, where city income comes from, who's investing in the city, and what that finance is demanding, whether it's still serving as much finance is the growth mentality, or whether it's starting to be in service of the city, like a city bank that's in service of serving its own inhabitants. So for me, these are the profound questions that every city needs to be asking itself. So 20th century economics gave us supply and demand of the market. It gave us rational economic man as our selfie, and the goal was endless growth. In the 21st century, we need to recognize our economies embedded within the living world and that we can draw on the market, the state, the household, and the commons. And that means we need to regain, relearn, expand the values and skills that make us not just consumers and producers, but far more richly householders, commoners, and citizens and residents in relation to the city-state. And the goal becomes meeting the needs of all within the means of the planet. I just want to end by saying that uh, I published Donut Economics and these ideas two and a half years ago, and I've been presenting them internationally ever since, always listening. Who actually wants to do this? Not just talk about this, but who wants to do this? And a few months ago, I set up Donut Economics Action Lab with the aim of co-creating open access resources for anybody who wants to put these ideas in practice. And the four communities that we're focusing on are teachers, community groups, businesses, and cities. For the sake of time, I'll just mention our work with cities. We're starting now in Portland, Amsterdam, and Philadelphia. We've created a donut tool that scales the donut concept down to the city level, asking through four lenses, local and global, social and ecological, what does it mean for the inhabitants of this city to thrive? What would it mean for the city to thrive within its ecological habitat? How can we ensure the health of the whole planet in the way we live here? And how can we respect the well-being of people worldwide? We've just, the last 10 days, run workshops in these cities. And so here you're seeing city officials and local community organizations sitting around this donut portrait, connecting and looking at the tensions and the synergies and finding new ways of reimagining the future of their city. It's a pilot phase. We're going to practice it and learn it over the coming six months. Once it's ready and good enough to share, we're going to open access it. And we would love you to join us and use it and help us improve it and connect it to the EcoCity standards. Let's make something better with all of us together because this is teamwork. I leave you to imagine your own life on the donut table and imagine how you live in your city and what it does to help bring humanity into this space. And if you want to be in touch with us at Donut Economics Action Lab, just Fill in the little form that's at this URL, and as soon as we're up and running and ready with our platform, we will let you know. So I'm just going to leave it right there and look forward to the discussion questions and really looking forward to Julian's contribution as well. Thank you very much. Great. All right. Thank you, Kate. That was brilliant, as always. Um, I'm such a big fan of you and your work. So we have, uh, because Kate has to leave uh, early, we have, if there's burning questions, we'll take one or two burning questions. Otherwise, we'll bring Julian up, and then we can have questions with both of them. So I've got one question. Please go to the mic as fast as you can, and um, go ahead for a question for Kate. Kate, you can hear us, right? 
Can you hear us? I can. Shall I stop sharing my slides or shall I leave them up? You, you're good the way you are, I think. Uh, or you can stop sharing if you want. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, okay. go ahead. We have two I questions. Um, I think that every day we hear from news organizations about our GDP growth and NASDAQ and Dow numbers as a measurement of how well our economy is doing. I think that we should be hearing some sort of number that indicates how we're doing with our footprint on the environment so that we can have that in our mind and track our progress. Do you know um, any progress towards that goal or of any way that that's going to be happening? Some sort of number that could so be reported. Point. Yeah, we need, so, so people pay attention to numbers and the media love numbers. Uh, so a bit of hope on that is that if 15 years ago I'd said to you, hey, what's your carbon footprint? None of us would have known what we were talking about. So this is, the, our, the notion of our carbon footprint is a new metric that we are learning to be um, articulate with too slowly. Um, and we don't hear about it on the news as much, but we are beginning to use ecological and social metrics. And, and one of the very reasons why I added the social foundation to the planetary boundaries and created this donut was so that we could start giving ourselves social and ecological metrics that are fit for the 21st century. So the work at Leeds that scale this down to the national level, again, I pull that out, I show it to GovDate, that's when they all get excited. Where are we? Where are we in collab next to our competitors, our neighbors? So we're beginning to change the metrics. The real challenge, though, you're talking about NASDAQ and GDP. GDP comes out every quarter, NASDAQ comes out every 10 minutes, or, you know, it's continual running. We are going to take a while to have real-time data on these things. But, again, we're getting much closer. The Internet of Things means there are literally websites where you can see how the trees are breathing, how the bre they're breathing in the, the, the carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen. We're getting better at infographics of ice melt. So the, the news is tragic that we're getting. And we need to, where your question's going, we need to find also the positive metrics that start to reward cities, that start to reward companies and nations and report on that. So I think it's a very, very important project that people are starting to do, carbon disclosure project. It's, it's taking too long, but we're going to get there in terms of dislodging GDP. I hear so many national and, and, and city politicians, though, even when they use GDP, they know it's defunct. So we need to replace it. It's, we're pushing on an open door. Thank you. Okay, next question, please. Hi, James. Uh, uh, sorry, my name is James. I work for the Vancouver Economic Commission. And um, hi there. My colleagues are actually there with you, uh, and I'm so jealous that I'm, that I'm not there to uh, work with you ah. on this. Um, but Vancouver is actually going to be an advisory city to the Thriving Cities Initiative, so we're super excited about that. I was actually going to ask the same question because it's a really important question. What are the metrics? And I'm responsible for reporting them, and it's, it's really annoying to keep reporting GDP because I want to report all these other numbers. But I'll ask a different question. Um, why do you think it is that cities are going to be driving real change around 21st century e economics uh, as opposed to national or provincial governments? I completely agree with you. I'd just be interested to hear more about why you think that cities are where this, this change is going to come from. Because, one... Uh, I think the, the sit met, so cities here at the C40 have decided to be the alternative leadership where national leadership is failing. And so it's a story. They're beginning to tell themselves, actually, we're going to be those leaders. And once you start telling yourself that's who you are, that's who you start to become. So that's one. But two, when I sit in those city workshops, I just showed photographs from Philadelphia and Portland and Amsterdam, at a city scale, it's small enough that people actually can get the metro from their home to that workshop on that day and sit there with the re relevant colleague who works on housing or water or gender or food and have that conversation. And in a city, you know, it's not six degrees of separation. It's two or three. Everybody knows somebody who knows the person you need to get. I also think, well, look, I'm British, so we don't need to talk about what's going on in the UK right now. But... Mm -hmm. Where, I might, where many people are not necessarily proud of their nation, we feel a little bit that sounds a bit nationalistic. And with the inheritance of colonization from many high-income countries, it actually doesn't feel great to say I'm from this nation. 
but I think many citizens and residents feel proud to be from their city because they actually create the culture, they create the community. So I think there's something very powerful to tap into there that people feel more proud of saying the city or town they're from than necessarily flying the flag of their nation. So I think we're moving down to the city state. We've given the UNFCCC, the, the climate change negotiators, over 25 years. They haven't got anywhere close to where we need to go. So I'm putting my energy, my hopes, and my eyes yeah. on the C40 city leaders. And I've, I'm getting to speak uh, in, a, in a session tomorrow with them. And I'm really fascinated that the new mayor, who's the chair of the C40, has invited me onto the stage with him. That's, that's pretty out there, right? Yeah. I, he could invite a very mainstream economist to go and talk economics with him. He's invited me, which again signals something, something's moving. They've just launched a global Green New Deal from the city's point of view. So I'm putting my energy, not to say that they will achieve it because cities have politics as we all know, as any other level of government does, but they've chosen to believe that they can be the level of change. So I'm going to push and pull all I can. I would love to know your answer to that, but maybe I can chat with your colleagues. I'm meeting your Vancouver colleagues tomorrow, so maybe so, I can ask them. Thank you so much. You're so inspiring. I'm sure I'll speak for everyone here. Everyone is just so inspired by your work, and thank you so much for, for thank taking you, James. the lead on this. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, you've got a lot of fans here, Kate. And of course, I might just mention that the ecological footprint, when it first was um, invented in the 1990s, came out directly as an affront against GDP. And so there was uh, uh, some real efforts, a genuine progress index. There's all kinds of um, efforts. But what I love about Kate's work is she's, she's combining that social and ecological together. All right, so uh, I'm you're just very pushing... kind to say that. Can I just jump in and say you're very kind to say that? But this is teamwork, yes. and I'm only doing one tiny bit of it. I'm just talking about the rewriting of the e economics. The fact that all of you are there in the room—it's the network of all of us. So thank you for that message. Of that, it's inspiring. But it's my book only has any resonance because people are actually doing it. That's and and so it's the teamwork of all of us doing this that really matters. Well, thank you, Kate. All right. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Julian Ageman. His presentation is called Reimagining e Equality, Living Within Limits. Julian Ageman is a professor of urban and environmental policy and planning at Tufts University. He is the originator of the increasingly influential concept of just sustainability, the international integration of social justice and sustainability, defined as the need to ensure a better quality of life for all, now and into the future, in a just and equitable manner, whilst living within the limits of supporting ecosystems. He centers his research on critical explorations of the complex and embedded relations between humans and the urban environment, whether mediated by governments or social movement organizations and their effects on public policy and planning processes and outcomes, particularly in relation to notions of justice and equity. For example, are we as urban planners as good at fostering belonging, recognition, reconciliation, difference, diversity, inclusion? as we are at developing prescriptions for what our cities can become. Smart cities, sharing cities, sustainable cities, resilient cities. His conviction is that just sustainability, which foregrounds belonging and becoming, can help us think through both together. Worldwide, he is recognized as an expert, an innovator, and thought leader, one of the 15 most highly cited urban planning academics in North America, and he's the author of, or editor of over 11 books. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead here. He's the editor-in-chief of Local Environment, the International Journal of Justice and Sustainability, a series editor of Just Sustainability, Policy Planning and Practice, published by Zed Books, and co-editor of the Rutledge Equity, Justice and Sustainable Cities series. So please help me welcome Professor Julian Angeman to the stage. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Kate. Um, my work and Kate's work have paralleled each other for uh, many years. And in many ways, the concept of just sustainability is um, living within the donut. I want to go uh, a little bit deeper on the human factor in many ways. And what I want to start talking about first is the history of the idea of just sustainability. Because you know, I can remember 20 or 30 years ago when we first started talking about sustainability and everything I read about sustainability was about environmental sustainability. 
very important. My background, I'm a biogeographer, I get it. I know the, uh, the green and the environmental imperative. But what we noticed in much of the discourse and the practitioner practice was what we called an equity deficit. Equity was implicit, but not explicit in much sustainable development theorizing um, and in the, the practice. And so this book, Just Sustainability's Development in an Unequal World, really helped us, and I think helped a lot of people, make the links between environmental quality and human equality. At that time, in the 90s, you had Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, talking about environmental quality, um, and you had Amnesty International and sort of social justice and human rights groups talking about human rights and social justice. They weren't coming together. In 1988, Chiku Mendes, some of us are old enough to remember, 1988, Chiku Mendes was killed in the Amazon rainforest. I remember Friends of the Earth in London saying, this is a green campaigner that's been killed. But he wasn't a green campaigner. He was a social justice and human rights and rubber tappers president, uh, a union president, who realized that the forest, the rainforest, was integral to the livelihoods of the people who lived there and to the rubber tappers, and the, the workers. We in the North, in the global North and in the West, we tend to separate out environmental quality from human equality. And I think we've failed on both counts precisely because we've separated these issues. So what we were arguing in the book really was that environmental quality and human equality are inseparable. Wherever in the world despoilation happens, it's usually related to issues of human rights and social injustices. And so we said sustainability cannot simply be a green or environmental concern, important though the environmental aspects of sustainability are, but we need to look at a truly sustainable society as being one where wider questions of economic opportunity, social needs and welfare were integrally related to living within limits. So don't get me wrong, just sustainability isn't as simply a social justice formulation, it is the recognition, as Kate mentioned, that we have to live within limits, but that there is a social foundation below which we could we must never let people fall. So in many ways, just sustainability is about living right within that donut. One book that some of you, I, I, I'm an academic, I advertise my own books, but I'm going to advertise one or two other people's books as well. You must read this book. This book was 2009, The Spirit Level, Why Equality is Better for Everyone. And it really packed out 40 years of data to show us that environmental quality and human quality are related. Here's what, what happened. The book, the headline of the book really is, it's not poverty, it's inequality that is killing us and that is corrosive. It is inequality. And they looked at data across a, a range of nations, 40 years of data as I mentioned, and the point here is countries with the greatest levels of inequality had the highest levels of all social maladies, whether it's domestic violence, alcoholism, drug abuse, teen pregnancies, incarceration, etc. Everything increased with greater inequality. But something else increased with greater inequality, advertising revenues. Advertisers love inequality. Inequality sells because the poorest want to get into the next level and we're on that treadmill of consumption. Inequality, as they said, heightens competitive consumption. But something else happens when we competitively consume. We drive our carbon footprints. They make the point in the book that countries with the greatest levels of inequality have some of the highest carbon footprints. Now, when I look around the world at campaigns for climate change, climate justice, I don't see many people talking about inequality as a driver. I see all the solutions, sustainable agriculture, sustainable transportation, but I don't see many people talking about the real driver, which is human inequality and consumption driven by inequality. So my point, and this drives my message about just sustainability, is if we really want to understand sustainability, if we really want to think about eco-cities, if we really want to think about circular economies, then our focus should be looking at human equality and environmental quality, not separately, but together.
So, as Jenny said, my definition of just sustainability is, uh, is there. I want to just highlight the four conditions. We have to have a commitment to improving our quality of life and well-being. We have to look at not just meeting the needs of future generations, but meeting the needs of current generations. We need to rethink justice and equity, not simply as we did in the old environmental justice days, thinking about distribution and access to procedural justice, but there is a new form of thinking about justice now. It's called recognition. Black Lives Matter, Me Too, recognition as a precursor to reconciliation for First Nations people. If we do not recognize certain groups, then how can we do justice by them? So recognition, I think, is becoming increasingly important in our thinking about ideas of justice. And then, of course, the umbilical link is that we must live within ecosystem limits, uh, the so-called one-planet living. Now, um, I'm an urban planner, I'm a professor in urban planning, I teach master's students. I want to bring really what Kate's been saying and what I've been saying down to the really human fundamental level. And two overarching thoughts I want to give you that hopefully you can think of as I go through three examples, three very quick examples. Urban planning is managing our coexistence in shared space. I wish I'd written that. I wish I'd written that. Patsy Healy, professor in Newcastle in England, urban planning is managing our coexistence in shared space. Two words, coexistence and shared space. That's what urban planning is. But Leonie Sandercock here at UBC takes that further. She says, this speaks with equal clarity about environmental transport, housing and other conflicts, reminding us that whether we like it or not, we share space on the planet with others, many of whom are not like us. And we need to find ways of coexisting in these shared spaces from the next door neighbor to the street, to the neighborhood, to the city, to the region. Urban planning, eco cities, it would be easy if we were all alike, if we all did everything alike, but we don't. We live in increasingly different and diverse cities. How do we manage coexistence in shared space in difference and diversity? That's a complex question. And then secondly, and again, as Jenny mentioned, one of my fascinations at the moment is the tension between belonging and becoming. Ultimately, who belongs in the city or who is allowed to belong in our increasingly expensive cities will determine what our cities can become. But I think as urban planners, we're obsessed with visions of the smart, the sustainable, the eco-city, etc. But we're forgetting who gets to belong. We're forgetting recognition, reconciliation, difference, diversity and inclusion. Maybe we're not forgetting them, but we're not paying as much attention to the belonging as we are to the becoming. So I would argue then that just sustainability brings these together. But one final point I want to leave you with um, is this idea of human scaled planning. We're obsessed with human scale planning. Well, I want to see humane scale planning. We do too much planning which keeps people out of certain areas. We have poor doors in large buildings where the poor people go in one door and then on the boulevard side the rich go up to their top apartments. Poor doors uh, are an abhorrence. We have studs on the side of buildings to stop homeless people sleeping there. This is abhorrent. So I want to give three challenges for eco cities. Three examples. Spatial justice. How do we allocate rights in urban spaces and places? Secondly, food justice. What is local food in an intercultural society, and thirdly, sharing cities. How do we see the whole city as a shared space, not simply Uber, Airbnb, and TaskRabbit? That's not what sharing is about. I want to look at sharing the whole city. So first, let's look at spatial justice. Many cities have walls across them, stopping people. But many other cities don't have a wall. They have a freeway, a creek or river, uh, a railway line. When I'd give this talk in, in the US, I would ask people to put their hands up. Who grew up in a city where on one side of the rail tracks you lived and on the other side they lived? We live in spatially unjust cities. And I think spatial justice is a really useful term for us to use 
in addition to social justice. And fortunately, we have one of the most powerful tools, well, the most powerful tool geography has given to the world since the map in geographic information systems to unravel some of the spatial injustices inherent in our cities. But being an urban planner, I want to bring this down to the most commonly used public space, the street. Two streets here, Massachusetts Avenue, near where I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where the crane is there. You can see that's Harvard uh, Law School. The organization of these two streets, which are identical in width, could not be more different. On the US side, Massachusetts Avenue, might is right. Your allocation of rights to public space depends on you having a vehicle, and the bigger your vehicle, the more rights you have. The Swedes have democratized the street. Look at that street. That's in Sodrevegen, Gothenburg. To the left of the streetcar is a fence. That's the only part of the street that you can use private vehicles on. You're a child growing up on those two streets. How are you wired differently according to what you see? Might is right or democratization of the street? Now, we know. We know the effects. We know the effects. We've known them for 30, 35 years. Social interactions on streets, the more vehicles and the higher the velocity of the vehicle, the less social interaction. So on the lightly traffic street, we have much more interaction and we have people having more friendships across the street. On the heavily traffic street, far less social interaction. Now, what's the just sustainability angle here? Who lives on heavily traffic streets? It's largely the poorer neighborhoods. Lightly traffic streets, the so-called traffic calmed streets, those are where well, more wealthy people live. So car traffic decreases social interaction. Spatial injustice can happen through um, the um, volume and velocity of your vehicle. We are changing in the United States. Thankfully, we are changing. And these are pictures from the early days of the Bloomberg administration in New York. That's Times Square up on the top left. Bottom right, it's outside Macy's on Broadway. These are people streets in one of the biggest, most densely populated, car-dominated metropolises in the world. But looking at these two pictures, it tells me something about urban planning and I think about eco-cities. We will never get to where we want to be if we do urban planning as what we probably always have done. Urban planning must be about what is possible, not what is probable. And this was possible because Mayor Bloomberg had a great idea. He hired the top transportation commissioner, Janet Sadiq Khan, who brought in Jan Gale from Copenhagen, who enlisted and enrolled and engaged the fabulous transportation activism community in New York. So they built a top bottom, bottom top coalition that wanted change. And some of the streets in New York are the result of that uh, change. But, and here's the but, one of the problems we have in eco-cities and in developing these wonderful, sustainable, walkable neighborhoods is gentrification. And what we are calling green lining. The green lines around neighborhoods that are not like the old red lining, which was explicitly racist in the United States, but green lining is socioeconomic apartheid in many ways. Who lives in these neighborhoods? We all want these green neighborhoods. We all want eco-cities. We all want complete streets. And I've got there some um, examples of complete streets manuals from Somerville, Massachusetts, where my university is, from Toronto, from the De uh, Department of Transportation for the state of Massachusetts. But here's the problem. What is the most measurable factor behind complete streets or sustainable neighborhoods. It's walkability. We all know about walkability. And there is an app for that, as there's an app for everything nowadays. There's an app for walkability called WalkScore. Who owns the app? And I've put a little red arrow there. Redfin, which is one of the US's biggest realtors. Let's just stop for a moment to consider the implications of the fact that a measurable of sustainability, walkability, is really now owned by a realtor. And that realtor markets this highly desirable concept, walkability, through its WalkScore app. 
We've compromised sustainability in many ways. How do we decouple sustainable, walkable neighbourhoods from gentrification and greenlining? And if I had an hour, then we could talk about that. I want us to think about spatial justice, not only in terms of streets and neighbourhoods, but in terms of urban parks. Again, I'm advertising a book here. This is a fabulous book, Rethinking Urban Parks, Public Space, and not biodiversity, but cultural diversity. My friend Seth Lowe's argument in this book is that we're facing a different kind of threat to public spaces, not one of disuse, but one of patterns of design and management. The way we design and manage our public spaces can reduce social and cultural diversity. Let's think about that. How do we design public spaces for engagement? How do we bring people together across difference in our streets and public spaces? These are the things we think about in urban planning. And guiding this is contact theory. Very simple. Contact theory says the more opportunities you have to have contact with people who are different to you, the more likely you are to be supportive of difference, diversity, policies for integration and for flourishing of multi or intercultural societies. Going deeper again. Who's on the board of the Friends of the Park organization? In Boston, we have a rapidly changing city. It's not Cheers anymore in Boston. That was the, the 80s. Boston is now a majority minority city, but you wouldn't know that. It doesn't necessarily advertise that it's a majority minority city. So the people who are going to decide the future of Boston are probably not the ones who are sitting on the board of Boston Common or the Friends of the Park organizations. How do we engage new immigrants in the management of public open space? How do we do that? Because our cities are changing and our cherished spaces will probably change as a result of that. How do we make that change happen? One way that I've been looking at is what I call landscape links. And here we have an example of a Guatemalan American who says that the places that they go to, the, the Guatemalans and the El Salvadorans in Boston, are places that remind them of home. And one place is on the River Charles where the willows grow. Quote, I think one of the reasons that that place is so popular with us Latinos is because of the willows. Willows in Guatemala are very common. They grow beside rivers. People like Herta Park on the River Charles because it looks like home. So maybe spatial, injust sorry, maybe spatial justice is about engagement and belonging through helping people to find landscapes, cityscapes that are redolent of where they're from. Another approach is being taken in Copenhagen. In the highly multicultural district of Norriborough, there is a park called Superkeelan Park. And designers have worked with the local community to design a park that features the artifacts from each of the different cultures, uh, hundreds or so different cultures represented within the community. So can we have spatial justice through Design. Can we design in encounter? One thing I do really want to highlight is that this doesn't come about. Spatial justice and the spatially just city doesn't come about by us just thinking about it. What we need are deep ethnographies. We need to observe and to watch and to involve communities in what community spaces can become. And my good friends at the University of Sheffield are outstanding. They have a transnational urban outdoors research group which looks into um, um, ethnographic understandings of ethnically diverse neighborhoods. Refugees welcome in parks. How can we make our parks more welcoming to people like refugees? Okay, my second um, idea that I want to talk about is and again, this is a, a book advert opportunity here. I've been told that if I leave this on for 45 seconds, 20% of you will be on Amazon buying this book. So um, get, those fingers, uh, get those fingers going. Um, I want to talk a little bit about food justice. Um, we are obsessed with notions of localism, local food, buy fresh, buy local. Uh, we're obsessed with it. But what is local food in an intercultural society? So here's George and Julia Bowling, two tobacco farmers in Maryland. The state of Maryland is trying to get farmers out of tobacco farming. So George and Julia, being good US uh, entrepreneurs, 
have realized that they are 50 miles, 100 miles from Metro DC, Washington DC, where there are about 150,000 African immigrants, many of whom are upper middle class, professors, diplomats, lawyers, doctors. There are more doctors, um, Ghanaian doctors in Washington DC than there are in Ghana, go figure. The sign for their farm is the picture on the left now. They are selling African produce to the growing African community that wants local food, not from Africa. They don't want it flown in. They want it grown locally. What is local food in an intercultural society? Is it what the ecologists tell us we should be growing, or is it what these people want to grow? Similarly, in San Diego, the Filipinos in research have shown that their food is local food because they grow it and they eat it locally. That's what they see as local food. So I want to put forward here the concept of translocalism. Many immigrants bring their local with them. And so we maybe have to be much more reflexive and think about this idea of translocality that these different immigrant groups want to bring. Now, not many of you will know, but 18% of farmers in the greater Vancouver region are Chinese Canadians. 18% of farmers in the greater, in the metro Vancouver region are Chinese Canadians. They grow a wide range of food, but they don't participate in local farmers markets. What they do is they have their own parallel network of markets. And I gave this talk about 10 years ago in Vancouver and I, um, a, a young African woman put her hand up and she said, oh, I always go to the Chinese markets because they sell my food. They sell what I want to grow. What I'm trying to do here is problematize some of the generalizations that we make when we talk about the public. We need to go beneath. We are experiencing shifting publics. We have multiple publics. And to just talk about the public and the public interest is meaningless today. We need to think about all of these different groups and what they want and how we can accommodate this coexistence in shared space. Um, Ten years ago, South Central Farms, the biggest urban farm in North America, closed in Los Angeles. And um, this, this notion of food justice, I think, can extend to the notion of what's called autotopography. The idea of people not just cultivating culturally appropriate foods, but doing it in a way that is reminiscent of home. And one gardener, um, a 30-year-old Zapotec woman at the garden, said this, I planted this garden because it's a little space like home. I grow the same plants that I held back in my garden in Oaxaca. We can eat like we ate at home, and this makes us feel like ourselves. It allows us to keep a part of we are after, um, who we are after coming to the United States. I don't need to tell you what's going on in the US at the moment in terms of the xenophobia um, and the anti-immigrant sentiment. Food spaces creating place through food is increasingly important in immigrant communities in the US because it is a place of comfort, of knowingness, of belonging. Finally, another book opportunity here, great book, Sharing Cities, A Case for Truly Smart and Sustainable Cities, myself and my, my good friend Duncan McLaren. I just want to finish by looking at the concept of sharing cities and really emphasizing this point that we are natural sharers. We shared before we competed. We wouldn't have got off the plains of East Africa had we not shared in the hunt and the spoil. Our cities were always shared spaces. They were products of an agricultural overabundance from a harvest. Um, our early markets were shared spaces. And hunter-gatherer societies depended on notions of altruism and loyalty and sharing. It wasn't till much later that we became competitors. And I sometimes wonder, um, you know, Darwin came up with two major ideas, one of which was survival of the fittest, dog eat dog, that's what organizes our society. What if Darwin's second point, that those species that can live in harmony in ecosystems would also be selected for, what if the Victorians had taken that point as the organizational factor for our society? How would we be different now? But the main construct in our book is what we call the sharing paradigm. Now, if you take a look at that, um, you'll see that on the right-hand side um, of the horizontal axis is what's called socio-cultural sharing, uh, ev evolved sharing. That's that sharing that we originated as humans on the plains of East Africa. 
on the left hand side of the horizontal axis is intermediated sharing, sharing through apps, the sharing that we all do. At the bottom is commercial or extrinsic sharing. Hey, I've got a room in my house, I don't use it, let's use it, let me, um, let me rent it out. Or my car has uh, got an, um, it's idle for 18 hours a day, let me uh, have it be used. That's commercial sharing or extrinsic sharing. At the top of the vertical axis is communal or intrinsic sharing. Sharing because, you know what, I feel good when I let somebody use for free a product that I have. I feel good. And apparently 80 or 90% of us across the world feel really good when we share stuff. So the bottom left-hand corner then is what we have at the moment, the sharing economy. I'm not saying the sharing economy is wrong, but what I want to see is a shift up towards the collective commons, towards the co-produced collective commons that, um, that Kate was talking about. I want to see a shift to a more collaborative and to, towards a, a civic commons economy. This is where I think my work and Kate's have shadowed each other. Maybe Kate, if you're still listening, we should write something at some stage because I think I take stuff right down to the ground level, whereas Kate, I love Kate's constructs and, and structures, but Kate, let, let's talk about that. Um, but, you know, the sharing economy is not wrong, as I say, but what it is, is it is restrictive. I have students who say, hey, it's all very well you saying, um, you know, let's, I can share my car uh, or I'll share a room in my house. My house is full. My family's an immigrant family. We don't have any spare rooms. Or when my dad's not using the car, my uncle's using the car. Sharing is still an elite um, practice in many ways if you don't have the bandwidth to be able to share. So the goal then, and again reflecting Kate's work, is co-creating this collective urban commons. So in the book Sharing Cities, we go well beyond the notion of the sharing economy, exploring approaches that are more cultural than commercial, more political than economic, and that are rooted in a broad understanding of the city as a co-created urban commons. And just one example of my favorite city that I've never been to, so if there's anybody here from Medellin, please invite me, I'll give a, a free talk. But Medellin is the poster child for social and urban transformation through this notion of social urbanism. Social urbanism is just sustainability, focusing on the needs of the disadvantaged while trying to live within ecosystem limits. And the great thing about Medellin is it's done it through funding or through revenue from its own public utility. They've built these library parks, they've built wonderful facilities, but the facilities have been focused on the most disadvantaged neighborhoods. Some of the structures that um, are visible in this, um, this, this amazing city uh, are, are right there. Fabulous infrastructure spending, but focusing on access for the least uh, able. So, my summary then, we must think about urban planning, about eco-cities as managing our coexistence, thriving in our coexistence in shared space. We must think about belonging, recognition, difference, diversity and inclusion. And we can think about what cities can become, but we need to redouble our efforts to make sure more people can belong in our cities. We need to foster engagement through using deep ethnographies, Let's stop using these um, design charrettes where we already know what we're going to do. We just invite the community in to push a few bits around and then we say bye and we go and do what we always were going to do. Deep ethnographies are the only way forward. We must engage intercultural, culturally competent planning and policy making. Does your planning department look like your community? If it doesn't, is it trusted? Is it legitimate? Can it really do the work of cultural competency? We must practice humane scaled and human scaled urban planning and design. And above all, social justice never simply happens. I will give my entire library of books, 11, soon to be 12, to anybody who can show me a policy that increased social justice when that was not the intention. We have to focus our attention, because social justice never simply happens in planning processes and outcomes. It must be intentional, front and clear in our work. We don't get to social justice. We have to start from social justice. Thank you.
Thank you, Jillian. That was just brilliant. Um, so I think we still have Kate. She has to leave fairly soon. Um, but uh, if there's questions for Julian and Kate, I'd ask those questions to come to the floor first because we have Julian with our panel. Uh, but anybody have a question for both, if they can comment. And Kate, can you just say something so we know you're with us? Maybe she's not. Okay then, questions just for Julian. <laughs> Marilyn? Um, yes, I'm Marilyn Hamilton and I'm author of the Integral City series. I really love your belonging and becoming. Um, I'm curious, um, maybe you can use the, the food um, approach. Uh, in looking at cities, I'm trying to uh, think about the eco-regions as well, their bioregions, and how there is a circular economy that flows not just within the city, but between the eco-regions. And I just wonder if you've looked at that scale of uh, larger cities in, in relation to their, their, their bioregions. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, you know, and again, I, I really wanted to emphasize that, you know, my background is in sort of biogeography. I, my first degree is geography and botany. So I, I'm well aware of the scientific imperative. But when I was talking about this notion of local, um, and if I had more time, because I usually spend about 50 minutes on that presentation, um, I would have been able to explain to you that, that what we are witnessing at the moment is the social construction. Local, there is no local, it's a social construction. It means whatever the dominant group says it means. So local could be a hundred mile diet, it could be, you know, different. But what, so geographic local is one thing, but what these immigrant and refugee groups seem to be implying is what we're calling culturally local. They are defining local, the Filipinos, the Canadian, uh, Chinese Canadians, the Africans in DC and Maryland, they're defining local in a different way. And my, my call, <laughs> given that local is nothing concrete, is for us to be reflexive. And if we want to build a bigger movement for some kind of local food, then what we need to do is think about what local means to different groups of people. And I think that's, um, you know, to me, that I'm not saying it... it, it um, negates notions of bioregionalism, but we are living in changing societies and we are living in increasingly different and diverse worlds. How do, how do we say to people, you know, that's not what was grown here, you can't grow it. I, I'm, I'm probably misinterpreting, um, I think, what you're saying, but do you want to? Well, I, I'm, I'm, is it okay, Jenny, or do you need to? Yeah, we have Kate time? here, but we will lose time to ask more questions. I, I can so. go to the panel after that. Okay. I did right. have a question, if I'm allowed, to Kate, that she's back. Very quickly. <laughs> Kate, Marilyn Hamilton here, Integral City Series. I, I'm really curious and love your whole donut economy. Are you working with any cities in um, the worlds like Russia, China, different uh, countries that might not have democracies as their main governance systems? Hi, do you hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Hear you. Oh, excellent, hi. Um, not yet. So the tool that we're making with the donut, we've just started making it. The first three cities that said they wanted to be part of this in the C40 were Portland, Philadelphia and Amsterdam. We also wanted to start in some of the world's most high consumption cities because we think that's where the moral obligation to start transformation is. But I'm really keen to move into other kinds of cities, um, into more middle income cities where, just to show that this tool can work at many, many levels. We haven't yet worked in, uh, let's say, non-democratic uh, non cities, but I, I think we will get there. And I think that'll, it'll, raise, it'll raise some really interesting conversations that need to be raised. When I get back to Scotland, I'll contact you. I have All some right. contacts. All right, thank you. We have time for one more question for Kate and Julian, and we'll have to go to the panel. Okay. Um, Hi, Patrick Henry, City of Vancouver. Uh, seems like one of the biggest divides in the world, anywhere in the world today, is uh, rural to urban. I don't think she can hear me. Um, Can't hear anything. Oh. Uh, the biggest divide in the world today is rural to urban. Can uh, you hear that? Can you hear me, Kate? No. I do. Yeah. Okay. okay wonderful. Uh, sorry. So, yes. Um, and it, we often take urbanization as a. a for granted as if it's like gravity, but it seems like it was driven by industrial revolution and uh, uh, globalization. Do you see any hope for helping to repair that divide between rural and urban, whether it's like political or through systems and um, 
yeah, do you see any hope in the world for helping to repair that divide? And what can cities do? So what can cities do so to repair the divide? Okay. Thanks, and can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? The gentleman at the microphone. Thank you. Okay, so uh, so I showed those technologies of centralizing and distributed, and to me that is the great hope because you can pop solar energy or wind turbines or uh, any renewable energy. Thank thank to the sun that energy generation is far more evenly distributed than the fossil fuel reserves of the last century. So we can generate energy in many places. You can bring. Uh, mobile networks to many, many places. We can use open source software and, open, and Creative Commons licensing and have far more local production. So that is why I love the potential of Fab Labs and Makerspaces. That, to me, what, the, the most important thing that's distributed worldwide is human capability. And it's the most underinvested in, in the health and education of every young person, because that is the greatest resource. And I see the possibilities of these technologies coming together and leapfrogging what the state has been able to do in terms of providing education, what, what private sector is ever going to do in providing these possibilities. Of course, it requires investment, but I think uh, possibility of small decentralized manufacturing hubs will enable people not to have to migrate to cities because many people like international migrants, people don't want to migrate, but they so often feel forced to migrate. So if there can be reasons that enable them to stay in the community in which they were born, as Julian was so beautifully describing, where they have always grown their food, that is where their culture and connection comes from. I think these decentralized technologies are a huge opportunity if we manage to make them work for the commons of the people and not get captured by large corporate interests. would much rather capture them and stop that from happening. Thank you, Kate. And Kate, I know you have to leave now, so we will uh, thank you and say goodbye, and I'll turn it over to Julian to comment as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think and that, that was a great, that's a great question. We, we've always had, and, and, and our, um, our politics, our media is organized around binaries, jobs or the environment, black or white, rural, urban. Um, why do we need these tired old binaries? And I think Kate's absolutely right. The notion of distributed networks overrides these. And in, in many ways, so, you know, uh, my second favorite city is the city of Belo Horizonte in Brazil, the city that abolished hunger, according to um, Francis Moore Lape. This is a city in a capitalist nation, city of three million, that developed their own food system. They fix the price of certain foodstuffs that private sector retailers have to sell to those on benefits. They have people's restaurants. They have policies on um, uh, open space and the usage of um, uh, derelict land for urban agriculture and creating urban agricultural spaces. So this city also has a really progressive policy on access for rural farmers to urban markets, which is, 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 is pretty progressive. So I think, what we do need and what I notice around the world, we often talk about communities and civil society doing things, but I think there is still a need for visionary leaders. And when, when I look at Curitiba that uh, Kate mentioned, when I look at Belo Horizonte, when I look at congestion charging in London, when I look at Medellin and urban, social urbanism, when I look at the work of Enrique Peñalosa um, and Antanas Mocas in Bogota, these visionary leaders are, are, are essential. And, and I think the, the great hope for some of these, these projects, these, these projects that break, break down boundaries, is progressive policy making works. No, none of the successive mayors of um, Belo Horizonte have tried to unpick this, um, this alternative food system that the city has built. It was developed by the Socialist Worker Party, but yet more right wing mayors have not tried. If we want progressive policy making to work, we need to embed it. And we'll be tired the mayor then that tries to come and unpick. Boris Johnson didn't unpick the congestion charge that Ken Livingstone had set down. So again, this is, I think, one of the hopes in cities is progressive policy making that really works for everybody, that makes it impossible to pull apart. But the bigger picture is, let's get rid of these tired binaries. And I think the, the German Green Party in the 80s said it best. They said, we're neither on the right nor the left, we're just ahead. 
Great, thank you. And we're going to now invite the panel to join us. And uh, so please hold your questions until after I introduce the panel. And panel members, please just come to the stage as I'm reading your bios. And um, the first person I'd like to invite is Marcus Taro. He's the project director for Resource Wise Citizens in Cit with uh, Citra, a Finnish uh, government funded research institution. He's um, a corporate responsibility veteran with over two decades in the industry. He has held several notable positions. Among them, he has served as the sustainability chief at Nokia. There, he has managed global corporate responsibility activities, environmental and social responsibility, social investment portfolios, as well as disaster relief and charity donations. In his current role at the Finnish Innovation Fund Citra, he leads the Sustainable Everyday Life Project that promotes the change towards a more sustainable life in two ways, bringing individuals to make sustainable choices in their everyday life and by helping companies develop competitive sustainable products and services. Please hold your applause. Uh, there's no need for applause, actually. We'll just keep moving along. No, no, um, no. <laughs> the next person I'd like to invite is uh, Professor Nicholas Musiopoulos from Aristotle University Thessaloniki. He's the, um, going to be presenting on the Circular Economy Guidebook for European Communities. Nicholas started his career in Germany and returned to Greece in 1989 before becoming a full professor at Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. He's an honorary professor of Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and his research work addresses several issues in the fields of energy and environmental engineering. And he has participated in numerous competitive research projects with total budgets exceeding 20 million euros. He is a member of the German National Academy of Sciences, uh, Le Leopoldina. And uh, since July 2018, he has an elected scientific council member for the Hellenic Foundation for Research and Innovation, responsible for engineering and technology sciences. Our next um, guest is Patri Dr. Patricia McCartney. I'm not sure if she's in the room. Okay. So then our next guest is Sharon Gill, United Nations Environment Program also called UNEP, Cities Unit in France. Sharon is coordinator and manager of the Global Initiative for Resource Efficient Cities, which develops practical tools, conducts research, and brings solutions to implement urban metabolism systems thinking and circular economy approaches to cities in developing countries. An urban planner by profession, she is also coordinator and uh, coordinates partnerships and joint research mobilizing on sustainable urbanization for UN environment. Sharon has a very uh, extensive career working in the international sector, and she's also worked in um, resource, or sorry, disaster recovery, and she was recognized as um, most promising uh, urban planner by the Hong Kong Institute of Planners in 2004. And um, she has now established herself as, um, uh, sorry, she's been instrumental in conceptualizing and implementing the first multi-hazard mapping project in the Philippines, bringing together scientists in different fields and linking them with local government actors. She's also worked for several years on the planning advisory in Z Zambia, uh, where her focus is on capacity building. Sharon has a master's degree in international affairs from Columbia University and New York School of International and Public Affairs, and she studied urban planning at the University of Hong Kong. So thank you all for being here with us today. Um, I'd like to start with Marcus. Uh, if you could share a little bit about the efforts that you're working on. Okay, thank, thank you, Jenny. Two and a half years ago, the Finnish Innovation Fund started a program to look at can we change the everyday habits of Finns so that new habits would come with a lower environmental impact than the current ones that we have. Why would we do such a program? We looked at the numbers and saw that very many places in Finland, there were cities, municipalities working on how to become a greener municipality or a city. So similar type of eco-city work that we've seen here in the seminar. But in none of these plans, it included the people who actually live in the municipality or the city. And we calculated that there's untapped potential in looking at the lifestyles that we have. So things that we eat, how we move about in the world, where we live, how we live, and what kind of services and products we buy. And we noticed that if we can lower the environmental impact of one person in each household in Finland, we have 2.6 million households, if we can lower the environmental or the carbon footprint of a single individual by 20%, we can contribute to Finnish target, target of reaching the Paris Agreement by 37%. 
if we can get two persons in every household to lower their carbon footprint by 20%, we can contribute more than 74% to our Paris Agreement targets. So there's a lot of untapped potential there. Unfortunately, majority of Finns, and I think this is true in, in any Western, Western society, do not value environmental matters or saving the planet enough so that it would be the first or the second thing that they consider when they make choices in their everyday lives. <coughs> there are other things that are more important to us. But by understanding what makes us ticks as, tick as individuals or households and why we make the choices that we do make, and by changing the language instead of talking about carbon footprint or uh, greener lifestyles, we talk within the language that people actually use and is closer to the motivations that drive their behavior. And that's something that we try to do, so change the language. So instead of talking about carbon footprint or carbon emissions or climate change, we talk about your lifestyle. And we've created a small test where you can test your lifestyle in terms of carbon emissions, but we don't tell you that you're testing it in terms of carbon emissions. We just tell you, tell you that you can test your lifestyle. And by answering 27 questions regarding how you, what you eat, where you live, how do you move about, and what kind of products and services you buy, we can give you tailored individual suggestions how to improve your life. And by doing that, also lower the carbon footprint. And why we say that is based on the fact that, according to our studies, people who even think that they live in a sustainable manner, they're actually more satisfied with their life. And this breaks the kind of previous discussion terms that typically people associate sustainable sustainability or green behavior with something that they need to give up, they need to stop, they've done something wrong, and all of the language that we use is give you options that you can do more of. And those things that you do more of, they replace the bad behavior. But we are never saying that you're doing something wrong. We want to say that what you can do more of. And while changing the language, we can also tap into the fact that as an average Finn has a carbon footprint of 10,000 kilograms of CO2, if we just work with one person, so I work on my carbon footprint, I can only work on the 10,000 kilograms. But if we can change the language so that I feel comfortable discussing this and sharing what I actually do and how I've improved my life, then I can talk to a friend, a colleague, a family member, and suddenly I'm working maybe a million kilograms of CO2. Then a business can work with their customers or non-governmental organizations can work with their members. And we heard Kate talk about the commons. So we believe that there's a lot of opportunity to actually work with groups of people who are not green or environmental, but they work on the health of the heart or the elderly or someone like that. And then we can introduce these sustainable practices to these organizations and they can then work with their membership. And we've been relatively successful in this work. So today, more than 780,000 times someone in Finland has made this lifestyle test. And that means that we are talking about maybe 26% of the adult population. So like we were talking earlier, earlier Kate was saying that we need a new metric, so the carbon footprint. So we, I can comfortably say that almost 30% of Finns now know what their carbon footprint is, but more importantly, they know what they can do to improve their life and lower their footprint. That's fantastic. Thanks a lot. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, and the next person who's going to speak is Professor Musiopoulos. He brings with us uh, information from an EcoCity forum that took place last year uh, that produced a circular economy guidebook for European communities. Thank you very much, Jenny. Could I have the slides? Thank you. Let me start showing you where I come from, Thessaloniki, a historic city with the largest university in Greece. We are 
in a laboratory specialized uh, in circular economy, and therefore uh, I show you also the URL for more information. Primarily, however, I'm representing in this summit the EcoCity Greece, which is a voluntary non-profit organization, focuses primarily on the quality and sustainability of the urban environment. Here again, the URL. Um, in a question posed to Kate, the, it was uh, asked why cities are so important for circular change. Uh, I think this uh, slide demonstrates very clearly uh, why cities can act as cradles and catalysts for the cir circular change, simply because the, uh, the density is there uh, and the scale of citizens, businesses, material and resource flows. They have the autonomy to regulate and incentivize. They can connect stakeholders. There could be, of course, the vision and strategy needed. And therefore, I, we believe that we should start with the cities in order to uh, implement a circular economy. And as uh, Jenny said, for this reason, we had uh, a large event one year ago in Thessaloniki with uh, several very important ex experts from uh, all over the world, including Jenny, uh, you see that we uh, wanted primarily to have as an output um, a guidebook which would help European cities to find their roadmap uh, towards circular economy. And uh, I think that this guidebook, which uh, you can download uh, with, where are the URLs here, in its existing uh, I would say mature draft uh, version uh, allows uh, several things. First of all, you, uh, cities can um, outline their challenges in the um, existing philosophy of linear economy. They can explore the alternatives um, uh, in order to become a circular city. They can find ways to finance uh, the pathway to circularity. In addition, um, one can see the large potential for networking because if we achieve in a city common understanding, then uh, one can raise awareness um, about and promote circular solutions. These solutions, of course, are not the same for each city because you have to understand that the specific specificities in each city define also which solutions are the most appropriate. Uh, our stakeholders should be involved, of course, for identifying and implementing the circular uh, practices. And therefore, within the guidebook, we advocate for assembling uh, actors from go uh, government, academia, industries, and the uh, civil society. Of course, the elements in the, uh, of the roadmap is to identify the priority areas for the circular transition, to formulate the recommendations, to create a platform for constructive dialogue, uh, and of course to um, uh, see how the um, uh, procedure will be implemented with the active role of the stakeholders. So the key here is understanding, connecting, and networking, and then going to the uh, solution. Prerequisite is knowledge, and the knowledge of course comes out of scientific fora like the, this one. Um, defining the competitive advantages and um, understanding also the factors that differentiate the specific region and city from other cities and regions. Because you can learn from good examples, but you can never be sure that transferring a good practice is good for your own city. Because you have to always take into consideration the factors which differentiate your city uh, from the others. And we sp speak here, of course, on a number of topics uh, which go through built environment, energy, mobility, uh, food, includes things like bioeconomy, smart farming, and many other things which we try to describe briefly, of course, in this uh, guidebook. So I invite you to download the guidebook um, and uh, as I said, and I started with the, um, with the uh, URLs of both EcoCity and our lab, you can contact us if you want to interact with us. I hope that this will, will be the launching of a start of connections with others uh, in order to achieve our goal, which is really to implement circular economy. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Musiopoulos. So you can start to see how some of these ideas from um, Kate and Julian's work are, are getting some traction. And our third um, presenter is Sharon Gill, uh, Cities Unit, United Nations Environment Program, talking about bending the urban metabolism, a report from Brussels. Thank you. Uh, my slides. Should be coming up any minute. I'm sure they're working on it in the back. There we go. All right. So um, I had intended to originally talk about the work in Brussels, but I thought that it would be best to respond um, to Kate and Julian's work, which really resonates with our own. So I'll be presenting a more uh, broader overview of our work. Um, before I do that, let me um, let you in on a secret. Well, not really a secret. In UNEP, um, not all UN agencies are created equal. And UNEP is really a bunch of nerds. Uh, so the agency that I come from is full of um, uh, what before we became civil servants, we, bec we were former scientists with a lot of research background um, or practitioners like myself. So we're, we, we're really into our specific subjects. And, um, and this is something that um, that not a lot of people know about because they, they look at the UN and the general images of, the, of our humanitarian colleagues who are um, a lot sexier in terms of their work. So what do we do? So we try to bridge uh, science, and, um, science and policy um, by taking the work of um, experts such as uh, Julian, Kate, and try to translate them into language that can be understood by governments and by um, negotiators, for example, for the multilateral environmental agreement. So one of the, um, one of the publications that we came up with, um, well, not us, but the International Resource Panel is called The Weight of Cities. I won't delve into The Weight of Cities report because there's going to be a presentation this afternoon by one of the key authors. So um, please, uh, it's going to be the keynote at two o'clock, right? So, it, so um, you'll, you'll get all of the details there. Basically, it's a report that tells about um, what, um, how cities can be, uh, how cities are drivers of consumption, but at the same time, how it can be transformative and how it can lead the change towards uh, uh, um, um, reducing our overall environmental impact. But what I want to highlight in that report is how integration is key. So one of the um, report's findings with that was that the biggest challenge in sustainable urban development is not, um, is not the design or investment in new technologies. A lot of the te new technologies are underused or we're not, we're not replicating them enough, in fact. It is rather the way we think and the, trans um, the transformation of existing practices and processes that's more important. And that's something um, that we really need to think about. So as UNEP, we look at a lot of approaches that would um, support integration. Uh, among this would be urban energy systems, for example. We have work on district energy systems. And circular economy is one of the integration concepts that we as UNEP are exploring. So how did we do this? So one of the first things that we did was to because we are a bunch of nerds, was to go through 31 um, indicator frameworks, over 31 indicator frameworks that self-identified as linked with circular economy, and um, look through over 2,000 indicators and found which, um, and, and tried to do a heat map, well, we did a heat map analysis. And we found that although um, a lot of cities, when they talk about circular economy, um, say that, oh, we want well-being of our citizens, etc. In fact, when they are monitoring progress towards circular economy, it's not among the indicators that are being monitored. So two of the gaps that we identified were gender and well-being. And Another process that we went through was to see how um, circular economy could be 
um, implemented in different contexts around the world. So we did piloting in, um, at different scales. So uh, at city level, we, we did piloting at city level, but at different scales. So uh, in some areas, it was bottom up. In others, it was more of a top down, depending on what, because we were working with um, communities and local governments and also city networks. Um, so there's a presentation in one of our pilots uh, tomorrow with Sorsogon in the Philippines, and I hope you can make that. Um, so we looked at uh, pilot projects around the world, and if you want more information, there's uh, the URL out there, and tried to see what does circular economy look like uh, in different settings. So what does circular economy look like in South Africa, in Recife, in Cusco, in Peru? And uh, how can we replicate that, the lessons learned from each of these pilots around the world? So um, another one, another thing that we're looking at is, well, so, so we married the global indicators plus the uh, bottom-up approaches from the cities, and we tried to see one of the gaps that we identified was that it's really difficult to uh, create boundaries um, in terms of identifying what is a circular economy. So we, we, we are currently working with ICLE, Circle Economy, to um, develop uh, a methodology in circular economy jobs in cities, which, um, which allows us to measure how uh, the transition from circular, from, from, of, a, of a local economy from, circular, uh, from linear to circular, using jobs as a proxy indicator, because it's so hard to really um, draw the boundaries. Again, I won't uh, dwell on the details. There's a presentation on this uh, this afternoon at 3.30. Um, I don't know if Yoke is here from Circle Economy, but um, she'll be the one doing the presentation. Uh, so in all of that work, what I want to highlight here is something that really, um, again, resonates with what uh, Julian and Kate were saying. Um, in the transition from the linear to the circular, what, what I found missing in the research and the action was that everybody says uh, private sector. Um, we all want to, well, we, we all want to, uh, transition to a circular economy, private sector, cities, et cetera, national governments. It sounds sexy, it sounds, it's, it's a marketable term. But in this transition, we're still not looking at how it impacts human beings or how we need to reflect on our values as human beings. And this is something that I would like to present here to this audience of thinkers, because really, um, one of the biggest mistakes that we've done in our existing economy is uh, having prices and the market dictate, uh, having that at the center. And we need to change that and build a new foundation for our economy. Thank you, Sharon. All right, so it's, uh, we're just at 9.45, but uh, we do have a half hour break. So I'd like to invite anyone who has questions mm -hmm. for our panel and Julian um, to please come to the microphone and um, we can have a, f a couple of questions and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. Any questions for our panel? Yeah, it goes fast. Mm -hmm. Hello, um, I'm Karen Tischler and I'm um, an advocate for professionals going back to the paid workforce. And so my question is, how could helping um, like mothers and fathers who like to go back to paid work after a long period of time, combine with helping um, to make um, cities more ecologically viable by maybe offering more um, jobs that are, um, you know, remote jobs, or just in general having these people work on solutions that are more creative and more incorporating that. So I'm trying to understand if that kind of work between, say, the sustainable um, development goal 
uh, number five of gender equality is already being sort of merged with econ cities here. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any particular panel member want to speak to that? The integration with gender and ecological sustainability in cities? Well, you know, my final point was social justice never simply happens. We can have a whole range of goals, but how often, I mean, for instance, you know, and, and, and I'm not making a, a, a point here, but in, in Sharon's presentation, uh, and equitable cities was the last point. It wasn't equitable cities through uh, bum, 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 bum. It was, often we put equity at the end. And it often is at the end of our thought processes. We often think about picking the low-level fruit, which is the science and technology of sustainability. That's the easiest. We know what we need to do. And then we hope, you know, gender issues, issues of race, issues of integration will happen. They won't. Mm -hmm. They have to be the focus, the goal, and the means should be through these other very scientific and technological and economic processes. That's the, uh, that's the reality as I see it, because again, social justice never simply happens for women, for minorities, for gays, for etc. So um, unless those committees are committed to, and um, unless those committees that are making decisions about women and gender and, and children's issues, unless there is a presence of women and children on those committees, you don't get a critical mass. And I think this point of critical mass is really important. I chaired a, an urban planning department and I had this theory that if we had a critical mass of tenured faculty that were women, that were minorities, we would be able to change the way the department thought. And we did. You can't do it if it's an all-white male panel. They just don't think about some of the issues that you and I cherish. So representation, recognition is extremely important here. And I think Sharon wanted to comment as well. Yes. So. Um I would have preferred actually someone from the local government actually responding to your question because there would be more examples of how that work would happen. Um, at the global level, I can, um, and as a, as a woman who just gave birth <laughs> five months ago, I can definitely relate to that question and I have a long list of, of things that could be done better. Um, but no, there's not enough being done. and. Um, and that's something that I, I really feel strongly about and hope that through um, our work in UNEP, we can better integrate that. I was just talking to Julian before this panel, um, uh, before this uh, panel discussion. And one of the things that um, I think is really important is for interactions f for um, people like me who are more uh, inclined towards uh, looking at the technological or the scientific aspects to partner with people like Julian or to talk regularly in order to integrate and, and to have reminders to integrate this, these things into, our, into my work and to the work of others like myself. Thank you. All right, last question, please. Great, thank you. So Santiago Perez, PhD student, second year of my PhD is on circular economy. Uh, and I have a question, it's related to this concept of justice, but it touches like all of your presentations. And is the concept of, of justice, it's a philosophical kind of concept, and we operate like through it, right? Uh, we're going through these very uh, uh, kind of bad crisis in terms of democracy, environment, inequality, and all those kind of big pressing issues right now. How do, you, how do we conceptualize this concept of justice as a universal concept? Because it seems like, you know, in Finland, people don't see environmental justice is not like one of the main concerns when you choose to buy something that's not like really sustainable. Um, in circular economy, we talk about a lot about technology, but not like about people. Uh, social justice is kind of undermined when we're thinking about like economics, uh, so like don economics. So like, how do we conceptualize? How do, how do we do to have a 
kind of global concept of justice at this point. Good question. I always trust the PhD candidates well, to ask the hard questions. It, it, <laughs> not very easy question. Um, just uh, one month ago, Jeffrey Zacks, whom you all know, came to our university and wanted to uh, see how Aristotle's, uh, um, let's say, ideas 2,500 years ago could be li liaged with exactly the issues that you have been addressing. I am not at the position to report now because we just started discussing, and I hope that uh, ethics at the end of the day will also here get the role that they deserve in order to really achieve just solutions like uh, Julian said before. This is what I can answer to you. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, I mean, I'm a big fan of the work of Amartya Sen, who, mm -hmm. rather than seeking perfect justice, seeks to reduce manifest injustice. And so my work really yeah. is about revealing and looking at and trying to understand manifest injustice and, and work around that. And, you know, and again, this is why I center social justice. It doesn't simply happen. Uh, this is why I also say, look at your organization. Uh, if your organization doesn't look like the community, it's unlikely that it's going to make decisions that are pro the majority of members in your community. Um, there's a great example of a non-profit in Boston called Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. They set up about 40 years ago, but before they set themselves up, they looked at the demographics of the neighborhood and they constituted the board of directors and the staff in accordance with who's in the neighborhood. They are one of the most trusted organizations in Boston. They're the only US uh, nonprofit to get eminent domain status to create city farms, affordable housing, etc. They are trusted, they are legitimate, they are effective. The funders love them, the community loves them. Let's get it right. It's not rocket science. It really isn't rocket science. But yet we have decisions being made on behalf of communities, often by people who don't look like the community. It's quite simple. We need to change that. Great, thank you. So that concludes uh, this morning's keynote. Uh, we are now going into the coffee break, which already started, uh, but it will continue on to 10.15. I'd like to remind everybody to participate in the EcoCity Sustainability Trivia in the mobile app, and also let people know that today is Community Day, so as part of the EcoCity World Summit, we have a commitment to open our doors to the community, and so there'll be a community solution stage where local people are sharing ideas about how to make an advance uh, sustainability here. We'll have a tech challenge in the afternoon, and then the Green Electronics Council will be offering their Catalyst Awards. All our concurrent sessions will be going on simultaneously, and this evening we have a free public lecture with some of our uh, keynotes who have graciously offered to provide a Pecha Kucha style um, summary of the key points of their various presentations. So please enjoy the coffee break and take this time to network with each other and with our keynotes. Thank you. <laughs>